on mute. All right, people, everybody could mute their microphones. We're gonna start this meeting and um, I'm going to uh, have our speaker step forward and where's my uh, full screen button? I can't find that, okay. <clears throat> Oh, can you get a cursor on there? Yeah. That I can use? Mm -hmm. And you just do the finger thing, right? To move it? Yeah, okay. I'll show you. Come on up here. So can everybody see the, um, the screen with the uh, PowerPoint? Does that show? Yes. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, but it's not on slideshow mode. It's on yeah. the edit mode. Right. I'm going to do that now. There we go. Okay. This is number. Now. Come out the house and look for me. Okay. Be on the block. Oh yeah, I'm listening to it now. <laughs> At least I'm hearing them. Very good. They may not hear me, but I'm hearing them. Oh, it's messed up here. Ed, Ed Cowan, we actually can hear you, and Fred is asking us to mute our mics now. Yeah, I, I have it on mute, I think. What, yeah, could you please mute? It is mute. It says you're, mute. you're not muted. I'm not. No, we can hear you. Yeah, this one here. Oh, for mm -hmm. oh, Wait a second, I'll figure it out. I don't know why it's not moving. No. Okay, hang on. Put this on. Are you sure he'll walk away with this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay, it's just a little slow, David. So, so you're going to go left, right, okay? This so one? This that's backwards. Okay. Okay, you're gonna start from here, right? Yeah. Okay, come on, step over here by the camera. Okay, folks, we're gonna attempt this the first time doing a hybrid. Everybody can hear pretty well. We've got a, a little microphone on. And um, Dr. Damsky's gonna do the lecture from standing both in front of the computer. And we can tilt that a little bit. So you can see the screen in the background if he stands up that way. Okay. This won't work. They won't see it. If, uh, I... No, they won't see that, but we'll see that. Okay. Right? Maybe I'll you can use it. the cursor on the laptop. They can see that. Yeah, okay. I think I'll do that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let me hide this thing. Okay. So... Tonight, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. David Adamski as our speaker. Uh, he's doing a wonderful presentation on morphological phylogenetics of Blastobacidae in the uh, Galakiaidae family of micromoths. And this is uh, what he calls a comparative approach using exemplar and supersaturated sampling. And I'm going to let him explain what all that is, okay? Um, he has worked on this with another gentleman named Paul Franson, and he is providing us the data and uh, findings from their work. So, uh, David, hey, come on in. We have some more people coming into the room. Our first hybrid meeting is a raving success. Wish you were here, folks. All right. Stand closer. That's the camera there. So there you go. Now that you can see him. All right. Okay. This is David Adamski, you guys. All right. So I know who I am. Uh, <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad to be here uh, and to present uh, the first hybrid meeting with the uh, Entomological Society of Maryland. And uh, this is my third meeting uh, in about 15 years. And uh, happy to be back. I just didn't realize how easy it was to get to the campus um, from where I live. Um, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, 
picture that's not on Twitter. So when you walk away from that, it's not on Bear with us. Oh, now it's on. Good. Okay. How's the past audio, people? Can somebody tell me if we come and stand over here for a second? Okay. Can you hear me if I'm backing away from the computer? We can hear you. We're hearing you. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm all wired up, so. You can stand over there, I believe they'll hear you just as fine. Okay, so okay. I may be walking around uh, during the presentation. So you may see me, you may not see me, uh, but I'll be here. Uh, so, what I'd like to do tonight is there's a relationship between uh, nomenclature, uh, taxonomy, um, and classification uh, through systematics and the building of uh, a tree uh, that will uh, in some way, which I'll show you with the example from the family that I work with, um, will show you how uh, these other uh, aspects of uh, uh, naming and classifying are affected. So I'm going to move this. So nomenclature and taxonomy uh, formally started with uh, Linnaeus in his 10th edition of Systema Natura. And um, both he and Fabricius, who's standing next to him, um, were students uh, at a distance, uh, time-wise, from uh, Plato and Aristotle. And they were uh, proponents of a philosophy of essentialism. Essentialism basically is um, a look at nature and a finding of attributes on individuals. And then Linnaeus and Fabricius to some extent uh, gave names to those individuals which they called species. What they didn't realize is that they were naming individuals and not populations, which is really important. And so um, we understand that they had no concept of uh, intra or uh, maybe they had an idea of interspecific variation, but certainly not within species variation. Their classifications, this one by Linnaeus on plants, um, is more like our traditional keys, very similar. And other classifications were more like Venn diagrams. Uh, the top one um, um, by McClay um, shows the classification of what was to be scarab beetles. And the bottom one by Swainson was of birds. So you get these Venn diagrams. Uh, Venn later in the century um, made those diagrams very popular. It wasn't until Darwin that started to look at nature in a different way, uh, looking and thinking about trees. And this is where monophyly came into, uh, at least as a concept, not a word, uh, where a common ancestor gave rise to other species. Later on, about six years after uh, the origin of species, uh, Haeckel came uh, with a tree, more uh, diagrammatic and uh, 
um, did not really address uh, a problem like Darwin was looking at, but still thinking about trees, thinking about common ancestors and uh, how uh, various biota uh, uh, was organized. In the early 1900s, uh, there were uh, two workers, two lepidopterists, Pierce and Medcalf, that started to look at, and they probably got it from the French. I think the French uh, might have been uh, the first uh, to do lots of anatomical studies on many different types of organisms. And Pierce and Medcalf in the early 1900s started looking at uh, the genitalia of uh, uh, Lepidoptera, particularly. Here, uh, we have three species, not by them, uh, but um, by me, uh, of uh, Serenhorn uh, species that are found in Southeast Asia and Australia, uh, three different ones. And what they found, what Pearson Medcalf found, was that the variation uh, within these systems of characters uh, were a lot less than what was previously looked at by other workers. And I'm talking about uh, wing venation and uh, uh, color patterns particularly. Not too long uh, after, uh, Mendel was rediscovered, and uh, Hugo uh, de Vries, uh, Morgan, and others uh, started to look at Drosophila. So we went from peas to flies. Um, later in the 50s, uh, uh, Watson and Crick and Franklin uh, were able to uh, uh, figure out what the uh, DNA molecule look like. And uh, today uh, we're uh, doing sequencing uh, to determine differences between species and relationships among species. And in the uh, 50s, Hennig came out with his work on codistics and uh, it was translated in 1966. So uh, now we have a way to document. Uh, and actually, um, I'd like to use the word calculate monophyly. And monophyly basically is um, a way to determine common ancestry uh, and how uh, current species, uh, it may include fossils, um, are related. And if they have a common ancestor, uh, like in this situation here, um, then um, you have support for it that are actually detailed on the tree. And we'll talk a lot about this later. So what I'm saying to you is that from this historical account, we have a toolbox by which systematists, uh, people who classify, um, are able uh, to do it uh, by using uh, morphology, macromorphology, uh, features of organisms, micromorphology, the molecules, and somehow uh, document this in a phylogenetic system um, so that it can be testable. So now we're back to Linnaeus and Fabricius and we're going back to uh, Lepidoptera. Uh, in Systema Naturae, Linnaeus uh, described uh, 536 uh, species, not described, well, they were uh, meager descriptions, but still uh, technically, I guess you could call them descriptions. And he divided the Lepidoptera into three groupings. Um, <clears throat> they were 
uh, the Papilio for butterflies and skippers, Sphinx, uh, and uh, the third one, uh, Felina. Uh, and some of these names uh, may be very uh, common for you, and I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Felina uh, was further uh, uh, subdivided into six groups. So we had uh, Bombex, Noctua, uh, Geometra, uh, Tortrix, Pyrales, and Tinea. Now, Tinea is the group that we're going to be focusing on because it includes the small moths. And uh, Linnaeus uh, defined the small moths as those that had fringe on the hind wing that were. Uh, wider than the membranous part of that wing. And they were, as I said, the smallest of the moths. Of the tinea, or of the Lepidoptera that he described, about 73 were in this category. Now I'm going to introduce you to three British lepidopterists. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, Sir Francis Walker. Uh, I'll introduce you to Edward Myrick and then Lord Walsingham. Uh, the, the British were a number one in naval command in the 18th and 19th century. And um, as a result, uh, any of their uh, colonies, uh, they sent uh, people to collect all kinds of animals and plants. They were uh, sent back to the British Museum and people like Sir Francis Walker and Edward Myrick and Lord Walsingham would describe the Lepidoptera. Uh, Sir Francis Walker described over 20,000 insects and many uh, were Lepidoptera, these small moths um, that were put in the Tiniaina. Um, and this is a, re a remnant of uh, one of the Linnaean uh, felinids. So <clears throat> we already have uh, a swath of material coming in uh, that three people had to keep up with. And everything that was small went in the Tiniaina. And so you end up with non-related things being put in a category. Um, Edward Myrick was another lepidopterist. He actually was a school teacher and he was very wealthy, funded his own uh, journals, uh, which he entitled Exotic Microlepidoptera. He described about 12,000 Lepidoptera. Um, and for the group that I work on, the Blastobacids, he described slightly over 100 species. And uh, I use his uh, references uh, quite often. And Although he didn't use uh, characters that define the family, he would generally rely on uh, features of the labial palps, um, wing venation, and wing pattern uh, in his descriptions. Lord Walsingham uh, didn't describe as many species as uh, Walker or Myrick, but he did lay uh, generic tables for various groups of Lepidoptera, including the Blastobacids. And um, they all really used, um, I should say Myrick and Walsingham used uh, venation and features of the labial palps uh, exclusive. But it wasn't until uh, the early 19th century 
uh, I should say the 20th century, uh, were the first uh, lepidopterists to, to work on blastobacids uh, from Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Uh, again, he borrowed from uh, Myrick and Walsingham using uh, the sizes of the labial palps. Uh, you see here, uh, there we go. Uh, the cursors on the one in the upper right pointing on the labial palp and on the, the one on the left, we're going to it, there's the labial palp. So uh, some blastobacids, most of them have the sickle formed labial palp, whereas in others, they're very tiny. My cursor's on the lower left pointing, whoop, that didn't work. Okay, we'll go back. Here we go. So now the cursor's on the labial palp of the specimen on the lower right. So you have palps that vary in size. Also, um, most uh, blastobacids, if you look at the hind wing, um, I'm going to put the cursor on the upper hind wing, if I can get it to move. Here we go. And this area is called the cubital area. And you notice there are four veins. So the cubitus appears in this species four branched. In the lower one, and I, here we go with the cursor. Uh, the cubitus or the cubital area is also four branched, but the pattern is different. Okay. David, what's the dotted line? Uh, the dotted line is a fold. It's called uh, CUP. And when the wing is folded uh, onto the top of the, uh, the, the animal, uh, that folds. Okay, so it's designated as a dotted line. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's one in the forewing as well. Um, uh, now, in uh, moths where the um, labial palps are normal and sickle-shaped or reduced, you notice in these where the hind wing uh, has the cubital area three branched. I'm at the uh, hind wing of the upper uh, specimen. And then we go to the lower and it's three branched there. There you see a hind wing that's reduced in size, much narrower and will not accommodate uh, a fourth vein. So it's lost. So whether species had three or four veins in the hind wing was important for generic limits, as well as the size of the labial palps. So based on that, Dietz divided the family into two subfamilies, uh, one with small palps and few veins in the hind wing or three in the cubitus and those with sickle shaped palps and a complement of four veins in the hind wing. Now, later Hodges, who I work for, added a subfamily and we're not really gonna talk about that. But we are gonna talk about my work with Richard Brown at Mississippi State. Here, uh, we have a phylogeny, and uh, it's one that I worked on, but I only worked on uh, specimens from the New World. And I did have to look at some types from the Old World uh, to make sure that the nomenclature was consistent. Uh, but basically, uh, everything I looked at, except for those exceptions, were from the New World. And what you see here is a documentation of monophyly at different levels of the tree. Um, the lower level, let's see, I'll get the uh, cursor down as soon as it'll go. Here we go. So there's the node. 
that represents uh, the family. Whoop, sorry. Oh. The family node. And you notice one through eight, those are characters. They represent features of the animals. And all of those in a row represent characters that define the family. If you move up to the next level, where the cursor is, you see nine through 18, et cetera. Those characters represent that particular subfamily. So all the species within that subfamily have those characters. Similarly, on the other side, you have fewer characters, but 42, 45, et cetera, and they define the other subfamily, okay? And then we move up and you have divisions for various genera, Asaphocrita, Holcosera, and down the line. So what you're doing is, is documenting and showing uh, or support at different levels that is testable. Uh, people can look at what those characters are. They can agree. They can redefine those characters, or they can use another way. Remember that toolbox of molecules, uh, or they can use a bigger sample size. So what I did with my advisor is, and I'll show you some of the characters that define the family. So you have two sets of wings, four wing and hind wing, four wing and hind wing. And if you look at the top and the lower four wing, you'll notice a uh, whitish area. Um, let's see, I'm gonna bring the cursor to it. This is the top one. And this is the thickening in the four wing uh, between two veins, the SC vein and the R1. You see the same thickening uh, in the lower vein. So character number one. Character number two, if you look on the abdomen of a pin specimen or even a live one, you'll see rows of spine-like CD on the tergites. They go straight across, they're irregular rows. Uh, if you get the light on them just right, they're amber. They don't show up very well here. They're more dark, but I'll show you a better shot here of a dissected specimen. And you can see those rows of spine-like CD. And with the electron microscope, if you look at figure 93, that's what they look like. <clears throat> and they even have grooves that scales would have. Uh, if I had taken a more magnified shot, you would see that a lot better. Right, pretty magnified. What, what sort of magnification is that, 93? Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but it's it's lower than 100. Oh, it is lower than 100? Yes, 90? yeah. So what we found in our study is that the genitalia made the vast majority of characters that helped us to produce that phylogeny that I showed you. And here is a male, and I'm just, I'm not gonna go through all the characters um, and bore you to death, um, but essentially you're looking at the back end of the animal. Uh, this preparation was drawn from uh, the genitalia that is the way they're mounted on the slide. So these arms to the left and to the right, and let me get my cursor. Here's one of the arms. Other arm on this side are the valves. Uh, they have musculature that make them close uh, or open, depending upon uh, whether they're mating or not. You have musculature that connects to the top part. Uh, called the uncus, labeled U, uh, which closes that top part 
onto the female. And then the intermittent organ, this longish structure um, called the phallus. And it also has characters that are important. Whoop, sorry about that. Let's get the cursor moving. Here we go. So here in dotted or hatched lines is represented an internal sclerite. All the blastobacids have that sclerite. Uh, and all the blastobacids have a cetose tip to the phallus. Um, it's called the anellus. So all I'm showing you now are characters that define the family. The valves, you notice on the apical part, they're split, another feature for uh, the family. And here just shows you the different types of intermittent organs throughout the family. You can see the sclerite, the internal sclerite, um, that goes from the anellus down to the base. The anellus is cetose, very different, elongate and tubular uh, in some cases. Uh, some of the um, anelli have huge macro CD, like the one on the right. And I put this in, uh, and I'll talk about this more, Females tend to be conservative and not always offer information at the phylogenetic level. Uh, for blastobacids, uh, they only offer um, enough information to place a female into a subfamily. There are only two, or two species where uh, the females offer uh, generic characters uh, to help uh, with that. But you can uh, distinguish one species from the other most of the time by looking at the female characters. It's just that for higher classification, uh, these uh, structures really don't help as much as they do at the lower levels, meaning at the species level. So uh, here is a histogram and it represents the 11 most speciose families within the Gilichioidea. Uh, the most speciose family, uh, the blue, uh, represents the Gelichiidae at about uh, or approaching uh, close to 5,000 species. Next you have, uh, and I'm sure you've never heard of these, families, the ecophorids. You've heard of them? Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay. And then you have elachistids. But then when you go down to the second one from the end, the purplish color, BLA, blastobacids, they're about 500 species strong. And there are several families that uh, hover around that level of species. Um, all I can tell you is that there are a lot more. Uh, I'm working on a monofascicle that will add at least 150 species wow. to the North American fauna. And as wow. you go south into Mexico, Central America, South America, if you go into China, these are black holes. But the truth is, if you don't look, they're not there. Oh, but in this case, if you have a light and you set it up. No, but if you don't look at them, at them uh, carefully, that's, it's all one species. If you look at them carefully, you see that this species is actually part of the family. Yeah. Well, that's the truth. Yes, and, and that becomes a problem. And uh, I'm going to articulate that in a minute. So here is. The family itself is very high in uh, uh, intraspecific variation, and very low in interspecific variation. And so here you have the acorn moth, Blastobasis glandulella. 
If you go in the fall, you can collect yourself some acorns and uh, put them in the cold. And then uh, in the springtime, summer, uh, you'll have moths coming out. And uh, you look at all of these, there are 16 specimens in total. And if I was an essentialist, every one of those would be a new species. They would have a different name. Here, uh, you have uh, vast differences in the wing pattern. And look at the size. Some are at least uh, twice as others. Um, and so you have these ranges in size. And yet, same species. How do we know? We took similar uh, series. Um, based on wing pattern and size. Uh, we not only looked at the genitalia and made slides, but we did CO1 sequencing, and they're the same. Just high variability like that. Yes. Wow. Well, exactly. Yes. Yeah. But there was a time when they all got split up and people suffered and still are. <laughs> now here, uh, in the top left, you have Blastobasis glandulella, feeds on uh, yucca seeds, mm -hmm. seed pods in the southwest, and right next to it, you've got a Galakia, and all of these moths beneath are found in desert-type habitats, uh, even though, you know, a good taxonomist may be able to split them off all of these species have these longitudinal lines uh, running through the wings. And that's typical of many species that you find in dry areas. What you're looking at there are Blastobasis glandulella and five other families. And, you know, if you didn't know the area, and the moths that you were collecting in, you'd have to dissect them in order to figure out what family they belong to and what species they were, wow. and whether they might be new. Those five different families. Yes. I won't mention them because it doesn't make a difference. Take your word for it. Yeah. Now here, you're talking about six different species. You have Blastobasis dianella on the upper left, and you have five different species. They're all concolorous, all found in uh, boreal forest. And uh, dianella, we know, feeds on pine seeds. Don't know what these others feed on. Um, <clears throat> uh, but again, very low. Uh, in interspecific variation to the point where, uh, as in the previous slide, it spills over into other families. So um, you end up doing dissecting or like Jean-Francois Landry at the Canadian National Collection, uh, he takes samples of series and sends them to Guelph for uh, CO1 barcoding. And that helps out. Last species to look at is uh, Holcosra calcofrontella. Um, and here's an example of what I think is continuous variation, where the specimen on the left is sort of blah, more concolorous than not, with three spots, very tiny spots in the forewing. As you go from that specimen to the right, you notice that other spots are found in the forewing in these other specimens to the point where the last one, those dark spots dominate pattern. So a continuous type of variation. In fact, Jean-Francois Landry uh, collected some that look like the one in the, the left, the far left, and it was different than the regular calcofrontella, even though the genitalia were spot on the same. So uh, that toolbox needs to be used more often using different approaches. So in the literature, um, it's stated that 
for blastobasids, most, I say most, are scavengers or opportunistic feeders, feeding on aphids, feeding on uh, different kinds of plant material than they originally started from, um, feeding in argiope spider egg cases, uh, very different kinds of bizarre findings. Yes, and um, here's Blastobasis glandulella. It's an acorn uh, that I dissected in Mississippi. And um, it originally was described by C.B. Riley. And he said that this moth enters the acorn after the acorn weevil leaves. And we know this not to be true because I dissected over 20,000 acorns. <laughs> and of those 20,000, I had over 900 that had um, no exit holes, but yet had blastobasis glandulella inside. How are, ah, that's the question. And how did they get in? If you go in the fall, and uh, get some acorns from the tree, separate the cap. One of those acorns, if you're lucky, you'll find the blastobasis larva. Now, when you looked at uh, the females, they're rather elongate. Those elongate ovipositors are for uh, laying eggs in crevices. So they lay the eggs between the cap or as close uh, to inside uh, between the cap and the nut. And then the larva does the rest. Also, when I find larvae in acorns, the smaller portions of the gallery are always at that section where the cap meets with the nut. And then they get bigger as they go. So we have some independent sources of evidence to show what's going on. So how did you percentage change once you discovered that? Um, <clears throat> we were going to figure out actually when uh, eggs were laid, when overposition occurred. And every week I put five sleeves onto a white oak tree and a red oak tree. And about 10 weeks into the program, uh, we had a hurricane come through and demolished everything. And that was the end of that. Uh, but we do have this data and uh, we plan on publishing it. Uh, there is some data put out by some USDA workers that are conflicting with ours and we need to resolve that. So let me correct Bob. Go ahead. Out of 20,000 that you guys sampled, you found this. 900. 900 at a small uh, it's a caterpillar kind of inside of it. Yes. But no exit That's correct. And that's how we know that they get in in a different way than Riley described. So Riley just Riley thought that the that the moth laid the egg the entrance was through the egg hole. That's correct. Well, that's not correct. No, that is not correct. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that may not be correct. It is possible they also come in that way, not like right. That's true. But I also dissected acorns that had exit holes with no blessing. Yeah, well, that doesn't work fine. Yeah, but there actually, you why it doesn't work. actually, uh, there were some. Uh, that I dissected that had exit holes with blastobasis with curculia. So, uh, but that was a minority. I, I think that the, without knowing this group at all, it is possible for the moth to see that hole there and say, hey, easy entry, easy entry, rather than the harder entry to the top. But it was believed that they could only come in if someone else filled the hole first. And that, that's not true. And that's probably Riley's reasoning. No. Yeah. So we have another example. This is a uh, blastobasis graminae, a species that I described from Colombia, South America. 
and it's a stock borer. This is the first time we've had a stock borer in the group uh, feeding on sugar cane. And we also have another one uh, that we found in uh, Illinois in South Dakota. Uh, uh, it has a name, Blastobasis repartella, but we didn't know what it fed on until we started picking them up on switchgrass. And switchgrass is being grown um, in the West uh, uh, so that they can make ethanol. They get more ethanol out of switchgrass than anything else. And uh, repartella has been hitting the switchgrass. Uh, so there are stock borers in the group. And come to find out, we actually went down to Mexico and Veracruz, um, where a worker found what he thought was blastobasis in corn. And we thought it was the same as graminae. And we also found uh, moths at La Gloria in Veracruz. It's a uh, sugarcane um, uh, consortium. And we were in the field. There was a guy who had a tray with water uh, with a pedestal with a Coke can in the middle with a candle. And I was looking inside of that tray and there were blastobases floating in there. So we set up a, a black light and we collected about 40 specimens. We all thought that uh, the one on corn, the one in Veracruz, and the one that I described from uh, uh, Colombia was the same. We did some CO1, they're all different. So we have a complex now. And I'm trying to figure out by dissecting um, which ones. We actually found another species in Louisiana in a USDA plot. Um, they were using uh, Spartina uh, species uh, for their coastal restoration program. Yeah. And it was full of blastobases and it's a new species. So they were planting it everywhere. Close to where they do sugar cane. Right. Yeah, yeah. And finally, my last examples um, are two that actually are predatory on black insects in Thailand and India. Uh, the top one, uh, both have names. Uh, they were described by Myrick. <clears throat> the top one is uh, Syncola uh, chrysimorpha. Uh, the, the lighter uh, larva at the bottom is uh, uh, Syncola pulveria. And um, you can find these very easily. Uh, by chipping away the hardened secretion of the lac insect from the uh, branches and find them underneath. And sometimes on the top uh, where they might uh, make a cocoon and pupate inside. And they're eating the lac material, the goo that the lac They're feeding on the insect. On the insect. And, and how do we know that? Because uh, they're reddish. Uh, the, the lac insect if, if you see in figure 15, um, you, you see some of the females and they're uh, like a magenta color and the larva gets that color when they feed on them. They, they, you, they actually extract the dye uh, from these insects in addition to getting shellac from their secretions. It's different insect for the dye though. I know that's the one that they used to like the red rose. Oh, you're talking cochineal. Cochineal. Yeah, yeah. But they get the shellac and the dye from this insect. Oh, as well? Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We went to uh, uh, a factory in Thailand. They mm -hmm. showed us their production. Is that yeah, wow. yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they used to they used to use that shellac to make those old '78 records, those heavy ones. Really? Yeah, and now they're vinyl. But uh, the heavy ones were made from shellac from those insects. The whole record? Uh, yeah. The disc was made out of that. Yeah, mostly. 
They uh, might have had a dye in there to make it black. Yeah, I know that if you smash them, they shatter to pieces. Yeah. But that, I mean, how did they go? Because they had that much of I have no idea, but I, I know it comes from that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So uh, the problem is this. Was Adamski and Brown correct in their assignments uh, or documenting characters for the family and the subfamilies and setting generic limits like I showed you in that slide previous? There is another classification of the family out that came out in 2014. It's an intuitive classification by Sergei Sinev. Um, and he doesn't give characters to, you know, support any of his claims. So, you know, uh, to me, that's an easy out for me uh, to establish something. Um, uh, because he, he has nothing that uh, supports what, what he talks about. So uh, that's one of the problems. Um, and <clears throat> the other problem is, is how do we test this um, in a different way? So um, I met Paul Franzen a while back. I had some ideas and I had access to about 95% of the uh, material that we needed to look at of the species that were available to us, either in the literature or that I had already had illustrated. And so um, we uh, collaborated and started to look at this uh, in a different way using uh, computer technology and my knowledge of morphology. So we did two analyses and they differ in this way. Uh, the first analysis, all the morphological data uh, to make up the matrices uh, came from the type species of each genus. So when you propose a genus, there is a species that is the standard bearer for that particular genus. And it supposedly bears the characters that define that genus, okay? <clears throat> and, um, and so I made a matrix and it was 22 taxa by 149 characters or 142 characters. And we ran four different simulations. One was uh, maximum parsimony, maximum parsimony using bootstraps, um, which is a more statistical method. Uh, and the next two are also statistical, um, one being Bayesian. And then the last one was uh, maximum likelihood uh, with bootstraps. And I'll show you examples of those. But now I have to uh, name these analyses. So we named the little one, little guy. And the one I'm going to explain now is the big kahuna. And that one, uh, we got morphological information from either type specimens or specimens that represented the type species, something that I knew was that particular species or I had some confidence in that. And we ended up with a matrix that was 408 by 129, huge matrix. That's why we need computers to run them. And so we ran maximum likelihood on just uh, that one. So uh, yeah, anytime. Okay. Um, <clears throat> How did you convert um, the morphological absence 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 presence or it could be uh, let me go back to the females. There we go. So the female 
on the right represents females that you would see in one subfamily. Female on the left in the other subfamily. So let me give you a little morphology. Uh, from top to bottom, you're going from posterior to anterior on both specimens. Uh, the top part is a telescopic ovipositor. Uh, much longer in the one on the right than the one on the left. Where the intermittent organ enters the female is on the eighth sternum. So if you go down the ovipositor, um, or your finger, the oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's the ovipositor on the one on the left. If you go anterior, there's the eighth sternum. And this is where the intermittent organ uh, enters. And, geez. Okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. So the intermittent organ enter, enters there, called the ostium, the opening, and then it goes down this tube and it deposits spermatophores in this sac. Which your main organ goes all the way down that tube? Yes, it has a ductus seminalis that extends like a like a sock, you know, and wow. it everts itself and goes all the way down. Pretty impressive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Made me feel really small. <laughs> and so one of the characters is where the ostium is. And on that female on the left, it's by the eighth sternum where I showed you. Now let me find that cursor again. And I'm going to where the ovipositor is on the one on the right. And I'm gonna go down to the eighth sternum, that rectangular plate. There's no tube to be found, no opening. Not until geez, you get to where my cursor is here, just posterior of the seventh sternum. And that's where the opening is. So getting back to your question, I have a situation where I have a group of moths where the females have uh, opening by the eighth sternum. And I got another group of moths where it's by the seventh sternum, okay? The question is, is what, what's primitive and what's derived? What state? The state being, is it close or associated with the eighth sternum or the seventh sternum? So I have to use what we call an outgroup. And I'll show it to you when we look at some trees. But these are taxa that you know are primitive to the ones you're looking at in the in-group, you know, the supposed blastobases. And so those are like the one on the left. So I can polarize. And so I give a zero to the one uh, from the out group, a zero uh, to the one on the left, the female on the left, and then a one to that other condition. In some cases, it's a presence or absence. For example, a character that may define a genus. So let's say there are only two species in that genus. Then they have to have something that they share that other species do not, right? And so that would be a presence or absence. It would be a zero or a one. There are some characters that are uh, multi-state characters. And I'll explain those in a little bit. Uh, and how that affects a tree. Uh, and in that case, you have maybe multiple taxa that have a homologous character, but in separate groups of species, that character has changed. 
for example, maybe membranous in one group, sclerotized in another, um, and then uh, possibly absent or lost in another group. So we have three states. How do I polarize that? I go to the out group and I look for that particular structure and see what condition it is. And then I can polarize. And that's how you do it. And you have to do that for in the little guy for 129 taxa and then for uh, the big kahuna for um, what uh, was 142 and 129 for the big kahuna. But there were more taxa. So it's easy to make a mistake. And we'll talk about that uh, once we see some trees. But that's a good question. I was actually thinking of putting in a couple slides to show character polarization, but I'm glad you brought it up. So now we're gonna move forward. And these are two trees from the little guy. Uh, the one on the left is maximum parsimony, which I'll explain. The one on the right is maximum parsimony with bootstraps. The documentation or support on these notes. Now, let me explain. I'm going to get the cursor. And I'm at the base of the one on the left. And you see the three taxa here? Those are the out group, and they, they occurred exactly where, whoop, sorry. They occurred exactly where I want them, you know. They're not in the in group, they're outside of the in group. Um, now, you see that long line of solid circles. Those are characters, the numbers, are on numbers for the characters are on the left of that stem. And then the state is on the right. You can't see them. They're, they're just too small. Um, but um, that is high support at the family level. You, you got a ton of characters there. Uh, you also notice maybe uh, two thirds of the way up, there are two circles that aren't filled in. And those are characters that are found somewhere else on the tree, we call them uh, homoplasis characters. So somewhere else on the tree, you'll find that character. So let's go up this tree. Jeez. We're gonna go up this tree. I gotta get the cursor. So from that node, the family node, it branches into two. You see that? Okay, and you have the Hocoserini, one subfamily on the left and the other one on the right in green, okay? And all those uh, support values are beneath on the stem. The black means uh, those are good characters. We call them shared derived characters. And the ones that are open would be um, somewhere else on the tree. And oftentimes they don't carry a lot of support. But, you know, because the overwhelming amount are black, that's good. Now, when we go to the left side of that tree, uh, you see the orange part, that's one of the subfamilies. And I've indicated the node for that subfamily in a red dot. So all the genera that are contained in that part of the tree have support. Not as much as you see at the family or subfamily levels, but one is all you need. And in some cases, you don't see any, but maybe open circles. And that's the way she wrote it. Um, and we just don't right now have better support at those uh, levels. On the right side, the same thing. And I've indicated 
the nodes for three parts of that tree, which specify groups of genera, right? So you've got the first group that's closest to the orange with four genera, the middle one with four, and the one on the right with five genera, right? And then the support uh, for each. I can relate to this tree because those items of support are morphological features. When we get to the maximum parsimony using bootstraps, the one on the right, all the numbers indicate uh, are percentage numbers. So for example, um, let me get the cursor. At the base of the tree, you see the 100? All right, that means at the family level, the support is 100 out of 100, 100%, a gold star. And then when we move up to the subfamily node, just above, you see the 92 right here? Okay, that's the support for subfamily split, 92%. That's good, that's good. And then the next level for the green subfamily. Was it 92 million for the subfamily? Oh, I'm sorry. It's separated from, yeah. from your goals. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Those were all the outgroups. Right. Yeah, good, uh, good, good point. So uh, when we get, let me get the cursor. To this hundred here, that's the family node. Okay. And then we have a split for 95. And I don't know why I can't get the cursor there. But you see the 95 and across the way 44. 44 isn't that hot of support. And then if you go up that clay, you got 15, 22, 33, not very good support there. Well, general, general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then you have two clades in, in, or three in green. Um, and one goes 45, 57, 71. Uh, 71 is sort of good. 45, 57, nah, not too good. That's coin flip. Uh, then you got 17. Uh, that supports a 68 and 100. And I can't see the others because the, tri uh, the rectangles are in the way. How do I get rid of the rectangles? Uh, put the cursor on your image up here, top left corner. Top left corner? In your image, in your icon, your image created. Oh, my image. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Now click on that little tile. See the little double blue? Yeah. Go, go to that with the cursor. Oh, 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 go up to the little blue bars. Blue bar? Right there. Oh, your head. oh, I see. Clicking your image again. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, there. And yeah. click on it. Let me see what happens. That was the other one. Okay. Can you still see that? Yeah. Okay. Where'd that cursor go? Cursors. We can move that up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So for that particular clade, you know, not very good support. Please. There we go. It looks like it's kind of weak separating the groups of genera. Oh, yeah. But within some of those groups. That's right. It's which the two genera are clearly separate. Yeah, you got a coin toss at 52. Let's see. I am really having a problem with that cursor. 
I don't even know where it is. Here we go. So you got 52, coin toss, nine, which is really bad. Uh, I'm not sure why it keeps advancing on you. I don't know. See, it did it again. And then you got 53, and the other ones are pretty high. You got 82 and 74. But we're going to come back to this because in the other uh, simulations, they repeat themselves. And to me, that's pretty good when they repeat. Uh, but there are some problems in the repetition, which I'm going to show. Uh, your orange and your green are the same for the two different analyses, except your order of the, how it's set up are different between the two analyses. Yeah, um, but that's okay. The genera are clearly different, but as to which group that genera is in depends on which analysis you use. Well, they're the same. If if you look, uh, if you look at the the first one on the right, the maximum parsimony, you have uh, DOC, LAT, um, NEO, and SIR. Do you see those? No, I don't. Uh, those are the uh, prefix letters for the genera. I don't know these. Oh, okay. Well, well, they. Um, Barbaloba, B A R. Yeah. On the left hand side, the one. Yeah, but one thing about these trees is that those nodes can spin. Right. So. If, I spin it around, it would be exact. Okay. Just that part. If it spins, it'll match. Because you can spin any part of the tree from the node. Right. I'm just looking at the two on the extreme right. Yes. On the left hand side, the two are one begins with K, one begins with P. That's correct. And on the one on the right hand side, even you spin, they're, they're slightly different. Yeah, but they're the same genera. And if if you spin them at the node at the base, they're almost exact. And then if you spin the node of that K and P, you'll hit it exactly. So the next two analyses, what's that? Uh, okay. Um, the one on the left is Bayesian. It's uh, a statistical package, just like the one on the right, which is maximum likelihood. And um, there are some features to discuss. You still get two subfamilies, right? You get the uh, orange and the green, and the outgroups are apart. You see those? The three outgroups. Uh, let me get my cursor. So, and the one here, where my cursor is spinning, there's the outgroup. For the one on the right, the outgroup is in white the outgroup lines, okay? And then you have the green and the orange in-groups. And um, the taxa in orange are six. You have six taxa on the, um, the one where it's uh, Bayesian. And then you have four taxa five and four. See in that where it's five and four, those can spin. So it really doesn't make any difference. All those taxa are united from 
one group to the other. The real problem with that tree is you see where the red dots are? You have uh, a node, you have a node that has three taxa coming from it. Those are uh, what we call polytomies, they're unresolved. And what's happening with these statistical uh, programs is that they're starting to recognize the problem, but they can't solve it. And so when they can't solve it, they end up with three or more lines that indicate a polytomy unresolved. A resolved tree is when you have a node with two coming off and then two coming off of those because that's the most parsimonious way you can have a split in a cladogram or a phylogeny. If you have more, then you have an unresolved situation. It's sort of like saying insects uh, or all arthropods um, have you know, an exoskeleton and that's a monophyletic system. But then when you say there are different groupings within the arthropods that have the same, you're not, no longer talking about monophyletic system. You're talking about three different taxa that have independently uh, evolved an exoskeleton. So it becomes uh, a level of specialization rather than a character that shows support for monophyly. So you have a polyphyletic system that needs to be resolved. And, and this is in reality, you have a mantan which supports a polyphyletic system in arthropods. And then you have like others, Ims, uh, Sharoff that supports uh, a monophyletic system. So in this case, um, this one on the right has picked up two places where you have unresolved situations, one in the orange and one in the green. See where they, uh, the red um, circles are. Now, with the system on the right, and we're talking about maximum likelihood, um, we have more problems. First, in the orange, you have four, <laughs> four taxa that are really unresolved in that system. It picked up a problem, it's sensitive to it, but it can't resolve it. We'll get back to why in a minute. On the right, you see two red circles also indicating areas where it's unresolved. You have polytomies, in both of those sections of the tree. The same taxa are in those parts of the tree as in the others, but they're unresolved. And I'm gonna explain why in a minute. This is the big kahuna, 408 taxa across the board. I don't know how we got it on this uh, system. Uh, you see the out group on the far left, they're in white. You have um, the orange representing one subfamily, the green and the other. And this is a fully resolved tree, believe it or not. So what I did is uh, I forgot to put the numbers uh, that supports the clades. I got to do that for the publication. But I'm going to simplify this tree by taking all these combs away. So this is what it looks like simplified. So you got the out group on the left, you see it in white uh, with the long lines. And then you have a fully resolved tree in the orange. Okay, everything's fully resolved, but instead of six, taxa, 
you got four. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. They went over to the other side, the dark side. Yeah. yeah. The green part of the tree is fully resolved. Um, however, you got some added things going on. You have where the first dot is, you have the five taxa, and it's supposed to be four. You see truffula? Uh, yeah. let me, well, that's a new genus that came out of blastobasis. And whoop. Why? I didn't do anything. I don't know. Okay. There we go. Well, instead of four, you got five because you have a, an emergent genus. I'll explain those in a minute. In the next grouping, jeez. But you still said it's a fully resolved tree. Group. Yes, there are, there are no polytomies in this tree, which is really fantastic for its size. Whoop. Uh, in the next grouping, where the uh, large red spot is, you got you got five, and those equate to the five we've been seeing all along. And then you have four, and you have a new genus, uh, Cetosaura. You see that one? It's the second genus to the left. Uh, right next to Mastema. Okay, so uh, that's a new one, but there are some things going on that I need to explain. So we're going to go back to the big kahuna. And what I've done here is you see where the subfamilies are, and you can barely make out where the taxa are written. You know, it's that fuzzy stuff. Uh, at the top, right. Well, where there's a red dot, that represents a type species. And so uh, I'm going to, by showing you what happened in one genus, to show almost 90% of the things that got resolved by using this maximum likelihood uh, on the big kahuna. So we're going to where that box is, enlarge. And then we're going to enlarge again. So this is one genus, OK? Actually, it's two. You see where the yellow dot is? OK, that's the node that splits Pigridia from this new genus that came out of Pigridia. It's an emergent genus. Okay, and there are two species at the far left. The one with the yellow dot is the type species. I had to, uh, to actually designate it. So now we go to the comb, the big comb. And you notice there are three dots. The one on the left, the red dot is Hypotopa inotella. The one in the middle, is oximal basis per semiella, and the one on the right is Pigridia laticapitella. They're all in the same comb. They're all in the same genus, which means two have to go. So the oldest name is what we call the senior synonym. It represents the new name for the genus. Well, it's conserved. The other two are considered synonyms. So instead of three genera, we end up with two. <clears throat> now, if you look really closely at those names, you see some with HYPs maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, I can see them from here. Some are PIGs and the other one is AUXs. Well, all the HYPs and all the AUXs uh, become new combinations. They originally were in another genus and they got shifted into Pigridia. So we call those new combinations. So 
just to summarize what we've done so far, we have two emergent uh, or one emergent genus with two species that came from Pigridia that are represented in this part of the tree. We have three type species that ended on the same comb. Two of them have to go and be synonymized. So we have two generic synonymies. And then we have a boatload of new combinations. And there are some other things that are going on in other parts of the tree that I can only explain verbally rather than to, you know, make more mush than we, we have already. So the summary of the results, as I mentioned, uh, I showed you one emergent genus. There was another one that came out of uh, uh, blastobasis, that truffula, that moved over. We had a total of four generic synonymies, and I showed you two. Uh, two genera, and, and they got transferred. I didn't even explain that one. It's okay. <laughs> oh, but it's important. Uh, if you look at the orange part of the tree, there's only four genera there. And if you go to the green, you notice to the left, there are two outliers, Calisema and Imbioxa. They moved over from uh, one subfamily to the other. And in this case, you know, this uh, software is so sensitive. These species have a combination of characters for one subfamily and the other, and it moved them over. So here is a, a test that could be done later on using uh, we, we could go right to it and use uh, uh, molecules to see if those really are supposed to happen that way. No, because CO1 is a phenogram. It only shows you differences um, between uh, uh, sequences, between species, but it has nothing to do with phylogeny. What you need is a bigger strand of usually a nuclear gene that, and this is all done by uh, trial and error. You need a gene that evolves slowly, not one that evolves quickly, and CO1 is more quick. Uh, so that, and a lot of people in papers that I review, they try to use the CO1 phenogram and use it like a Platogram, like I'm shown, and it doesn't work. It only shows that one species is uh, closer to the other phenotypically by the sequence difference uh, in that CO1 gene. They use that to separate two subspecies. Obviously, if you need to tip type for both, right? You can tip by a tip type. <clears throat> Or primitive one and the more human adapted one. Yeah, I mean, you can do stuff like that and separate them, but you, you can't do phylogenetics no, I, with I, a phenogram. I, yeah. Um, so we're back to the results. Um, in total, there were 139 new combinations. So from that one part of the tree, there might have been about 30. Uh, maybe 35. So there were many others. Um, there were two species that I had to synonymize. Uh, I won't get into the reasons. I didn't want to do it, but I had to. In some cases where a species was treated as a synonym, I elevated it to species level. Uh, so it's called revised status. And the last thing that I want to show you is that those four parts of the cladogram, one in the green, and then those three in the, um, one in the orange, three in the green. I just wanna summarize those by showing you the trees and try to get some meaning from that. So here, uh, that's me. So here is the little guy. And so, 
Uh, here you have six in the orange on both. And then you have four, four, and five. And here you have four, four, and five. They match. Okay. Now, if we go to this one, we have six in the orange, and then we have a problem with that polytomy, but the tax are still there, um, except there's three. Oh, I'm sorry, four. There's five and four. The tax are still there, but we have an unresolved part of the tree. And then in the last situation, you have five with one moving over to the green and you have four, four and five. So the genera are still there, but parts of the tree where they're located are not resolved. You only get resolution when in this situation, when the uh, sample size is big. And then the computer can distinguish between multi-state characters, which I had used in the data matrix that could not be resolved by using those first four uh, programs. But because in the last one, the sample size was so large, it was able to connect the dots, so to speak, and make a transition between one and the other and keep them on the same um, resolved part of the tree. So if there can be any conclusions to this, we have a working hypothesis uh, that can be tested. How can we test it? By using more taxa, by using characters that are redefined, not like Adamski and Franzen, but like someone else in the future. Or we can use molecules to try to test to see if those two that moved over to the dark side uh, actually um, is something that's of importance or maybe they belong where they started from. Uh, and so we can test th those parts of the tree. When you say molecules, you mean gene sequences? Yes. Okay. Certain, uh, yes. Stable yes. Right? So we can take species that represent those particular genera and uh, run them alongside of others that represent uh, other parts of the tree and see what happens. If they come out and you know they end up in the green, well, then we have some support for that. If they don't, then uh, we don't have support for that. And there may be uh, an error on our part. So how much um, the um, comparisons when you have DNA sequences available for a lot of these, how does it correlate to your claims that you're doing? Are you finding good correlation or has not been enough of that done yet? I have not done any molecular uh, stuff. Okay. Franzen and I will start once this is published uh, next year, maybe. Okay. Um, uh, but it's not going to use a big Huna type of right. matrix. Uh, it's only going to be set for those specific areas uh, where those two genera got moved over. Right. And, and to see if uh, there's any congruence with our other parts of the tree. Well, that's what I mean. You'll yes. be able to make those kind of uh, yes. analysis. Yeah, numbers. yeah. Uh, I'd like to get a student that would be able to pull legs for as many species as possible and do a big kahuna type molecular study. No one's done that. Everybody that does these things, they take one or two examples uh, from each family and, and then they run a tree. I mean, in my estimation, th th this even though you might come up with a resolved tree, you end up with what we did, you know, uh, by using more sensitive uh, software, we ended up with a lot of uh, polytomies 
and we had to use a larger sample size. And that gets to the other part of the conclusion that sample size, you know, no pain, no gain. And this took a long time really to accumulate all this information. And for a grad student or somebody who's on the payrolls to publish, you don't want to do something like this uh, because it takes a long time. You want to publish salami science and take exemplars and then get a fully resolved tree like we did at the beginning, publish it, and you know, you're know you're a big fish. Right. <laughs> you know, but here it clearly shows that um, you know, you need a big sample size to clear up all these, what we call polyphyletic situations, species that are presently in groups that don't belong. And the last thing that I would say is that from the phylogeny we got, we can put uh, host plant information and make hypotheses about host plant preferences and evolution of those preferences, and also uh, zoogeography. Uh, the problem is, is that for this family, there are a lot of places that are black holes in terms of collecting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think uh, for a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of it will be speculation at this point. Yeah, as you have it figured out, something will come and muddy it all up again. Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> somebody will find that the acorn moth is doing something different. <laughs> There were two genera that were something. I, mean, I don't know the genera or something. Else. There were two genera that were called subfamily A. Yes. Uh, I'm going to make up a number that there are 20 characters that they use to separate the two subfamilies. Yes. And in the seven characters that were known before, five of those subcharacters were subfamily A. Yes. They were called subfamily A. Additional work. Found the other 13 uh, characteristics. And 12 of those 13 characteristics were subfamily B. So now it is, instead of subfamily A, it is 15 Bs and 5 A's. Well, see, you're using the same sample size for each uh, analysis. In the first four analyses, we were only using uh, one specimen right. uh, to give all those characters for that particular genus. In the big kahuna, we had 15. And all of a sudden, because, because you do it, you get more characteristics in there. And you can see that, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. this, these two genera are more closely associated when you consider all of these things with subfamily B and subfamily A. That's what it's saying. Yeah. And it's a red flag uh, that can be tested. Are there any questions from our audience? Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves uh, over there on the Zoom. Is anybody sleeping on the other room? No, they're there. I have, we have 11 participants, so uh, we, we'll be happy to take some questions from people in the audience. If anybody has something they would like to ask, um, please feel free to unmute and ask at this time. Um, Dr. Adamski is standing by for your questions. So. He's not standing by, he's sitting by. Yeah, he's sitting by, okay. Uh, They're so particular. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about you? I, I, he's, got he's got a question. Come on over here so okay. you can hear him. Go ahead, uh, Michael. Yeah. Um, I guess I was wondering, so it seems like there's a lot of, um, Interspecific variation. So, or I guess intra. Um, so, do you think there may be some plasticity in their genitalia that would further complicate this? I'm not seeing it, uh, Michael. Uh, not at this point with any of the taxa that I've looked at. And I, I've looked at a lot of them, including the student from China who's got oodles of species to describe. And uh, and the other part of that question is, is uh, I don't know, because many species are only known from the holotype. So you only got one, you know, uh, there's, there's no, 
no variation in that. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Gary Ouellette, you you asleep or do you have a question? He, I no. worked with him before. Yeah, great presentation, uh, uh, Adamski. I really enjoyed it. Well, uh, I have to give this presentation in Helsinki in July, and I got 15 minutes to describe all this. So that's going to be a real challenge. You can do it. I, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> well, look, at thank you for having me. Uh, I really uh, appreciate being part of uh, the uh, society and uh, great to be back. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, doctor. You're welcome. We have a, an audience here in the room as well which uh, consists of our favorite standbys and um, 11 on Zoom, which is great. So- oh, hold on, people on Zoom can see the people here on Zoom, but they cannot see the people in the room. Right, that's why I'm telling them. Oh, I should do that? Yeah, let's, let's oh, okay. let the Zoom people know who has to show up. Well, you guys, can, can you hear who's talking? It's our beloved Dr. Mike Terrell course is here tonight and um, we're glad to have him as always. Dr. Frank Hansen and we have Janet Leiden and Tim Thompson with us here tonight and um, on Zoom for those in the room I see Jean Scarpula, Randy Miller, Joy or Ed Cohen, John Bolkin, Marsha Watson, Michael Troutman, Bob Dixon, Gary Ouellette. I believe this is Harold Harlan. Yes, it is. And Phil Hi, Keen. Harold. Hi, Harold. You're getting greetings. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, Hi. <laughs> there he is. Say, Hi. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Um, are there any other questions from anybody on the Zoom or anybody in the room. Uh, I would like to say that the, the features in the room are fabulous. They have a new big flat screen. You can see it right behind me if I turn that a little bit. You see that on the wall and um, the uh, connection from the laptop computer is magnificent. It's a clear, crisp picture, really nice. So. Uh, UMBC has upgraded the uh, facility, so I encourage people, well, ho hopefully we can meet again in person. Uh, this is our first attempt at doing a hybrid, and it, it appears like it went quite well. I hope everybody on the Zoom in uh, enjoyed it and felt it was uh, uh, productive, and I think everybody in the room can say the same. So, um, success. <laughs> All right. Very good. And we had cookies. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if there are any other questions, I will go ahead and end the Zoom meeting and uh, bid you all adieu. Um, we're going to um, sit here and chat and maybe have a few things to say uh, for uh, a meeting. And um, can the Zoomers stay in? Well, if the Zoomers want to stay, I can leave it on. I don't, I don't know that we're going to say, okay, we have some thank yous and uh, I think does hybrid work well. Thank you, John, for the comment, right? Very good. Um, and yep, thank you from Randy Miller and John and uh, okay, so that was before, that was old, yeah. Fred, if right. you want to stop the recording, yeah. And whoever wants to get off the Zoom can get off, and the rest of us can stay if we're going to have a little business meeting. <laughs>